It's time for another edition of The World is More Interesting and Nuanced Than You Might Think. In biology classes, we're often taught that developing animals become one sex or another because of their chromosomes. Chromosomes are packages of genetic material, and usually we're taught that female animals get their traits because they have two X chromosomes, and males get theirs from having one X and one Y. This is the system most mammals use, so many lessons don't go into more detail than that, and this XY thing is kind of implied to be universal. But really, there are all kinds of other ways this can work. We're talking things like Z and W chromosomes, sex that develops based on temperature, and sex determination based on whether an egg is fertilized at all. Oh, and also, in the grand scheme of things, how sex is determined in different species isn't even stable. Now, to take a step back, for the purposes of this episode, we're defining females as animals that produce sex cells called eggs, and males as animals that produce sex cells called sperm. This isn't the only possible definition, but it's the one that's going to be the most helpful for understanding what's going on here. That said, these egg and sperm cells are collectively called gametes. Typically, they contain a half copy of the parent's genome, and they're all unique. So when two gametes get together, the offspring's genome generally differs from both its parents and its siblings. One basic reason for this is that it makes a species more resilient. When you have genetic diversity, it also leads to individuals with different traits. As an environment changes, this variation helps some individuals adapt generation after generation. So this ensures that at least some of a group will survive long term. It took a lot of hits and misses before people figured out how sex determination works, though. In fact, before the early 20th century, there had been around 500 documented wrong ideas about it. For instance, Aristotle thought male humans were a product of excess heat and dryness produced by the male during intercourse. Meanwhile, females were supposedly a product of excess cold and wetness from the female parent. Others thought that sex was determined by whether the embryo was on the right or the left side of the uterus or which testicle the sperm came from. And ideas like this survived for thousands of years. But around the turn of the 20th century, a scientist named Nettie Stevens uncovered one of the first right answers. While doing research at Bryn Mawr College, Stevens began researching sex determination in insects. She was convinced that it had something to do with the genetic material in eggs and sperm cells. Partly, she was influenced by Mendel, another scientist who had shown how pea plants could pass traits to their offspring. But also, her ideas were informed by a recent discovery the identification of chromosomes. Scientists had just figured out that these rod-shaped structures were the packages of genetic material responsible for carrying traits from a parent to a child. So with these ideas in hand, plus plenty of her own research, Stevens published a breakthrough paper in 1905 on sex determination in various insects, including mealworms. While looking at mealworm sperm and eggs through her microscope, she saw that the eggs all had 10 large chromosomes, but the sperm were different. Half of them had 10 large chromosomes, but the other half had 9 large chromosomes and one small one. Similarly, cells from other parts of female mealworms had 20 large chromosomes, but cells from other parts of the males had 19 large ones and one small one. Ultimately, Stevens concluded that this small chromosome must have something to do with sex. And she was right. In fact, this small chromosome would later become known as the Y chromosome, one of the two sex chromosomes you might have learned about in biology class. Since 1905, though, we've learned a lot more about just how variable sex determination actually is. The most talked about system is that XX and XY one, which humans, most other mammals, and lots of insects use. Not all of these systems are identical. In fact, scientists think X's and Y's probably evolved independently in several species. But generally, in this case, a single egg carries one large sex chromosome, or an X, and a single sperm either carries a large sex chromosome or a small one, so an X or a Y. This means sperm cells determine an animal's sex. If an egg is fertilized with a sperm carrying a Y chromosome, the offspring will be XY and male. 
Again, using that very narrow definition of males make sperm. On the other hand, if an egg is fertilized with an X chromosome sperm, it will be XX and female. But also, this is nowhere near the only way this plays out. Like, the sex chromosomes of some birds and some reptiles work the opposite way. In their system, it's usually the egg that calls the shots. In these species, males have a pair of Z sex chromosomes, so their sperm all have one large Z. Meanwhile, females have one Z plus a smaller W sex chromosome, so eggs can have one or the other. Then, there are animals that completely throw a wrench into this neat two-chromosome system. One of them is the platypus, because, of course. On top of being semi-aquatic, egg-laying mammals of action, Platypuses have 10 sex chromosomes, 10 Xs for females, and 5 pairs of Xs and Ys for males. When platypus sperm cells form, the sex chromosomes form a chain. And although scientists don't quite know how this works yet, this results in sperm that either carries 5 Xs or 5 Ys. Overall, though, platypuses are at least similar to other mammals. Once you move into other branches of the tree of life, things get wilder. Like, in some animals that reproduce sexually, there are no obvious sex chromosomes at all. Instead, sex is triggered by some environmental factor that determines which genes are turned on and what body parts develop. The most common is temperature-dependent sex determination, which occurs in reptiles like alligators, sea turtles, and some fish. For instance, in studies of the European pond turtle, incubating eggs at temperatures above 30 degrees Celsius produces all females, while temperatures below 25 degrees Celsius makes all males. And in between, you get an equal ratio of males to females. In other cases, some birds seem to determine their sex based on resources available to their parents, like the nutritional content of their food. And some invertebrates, like certain worms and snails, determine their sex based on proximity to some environmental factor. For example, some female marine worms release their larvae into the surrounding water. If the larvae land on the ocean floor, they develop into females, but they can also re-enter the parent's body, where they turn into males and produce sperm and mate with the same female they emerged from. Yeah. So, there are plenty of ways this can play out. And of course, there are animals that throw all of these ideas straight out the window, too. As a final example, more than 200,000 species of ants, bees, and wasps use a sex determination system called haplodiploidy. In this system, females can lay unfertilized eggs that, all on their own, develop into males. But if the female chooses to mate with a male, then the extra genetic material from her partner means the fertilized eggs develop into females. And the list just goes on from there. You could talk all day about this kind of thing. But really, it all follows one basic theme. In the end, you get one kind of animal that makes eggs and another kind that makes sperm. But here's the real kicker. Whatever system a species settles on, that system isn't permanent. Instead, over long periods of time, researchers think that what system a species uses, and whether it uses sex chromosomes at all, is temporary. Like, in a 2017 paper in Genetics, researchers describe a type of frog that lives in Japan. In northern Japan, these frogs have a ZW system, and in the south, they have an XY system. According to their mathematical modeling, the authors suggest that these transitions just happen by chance as these populations diverge into different areas. Other studies have suggested that in some species, there can even be an intermediate period as a species switches from XY to ZW, or vice versa, where sex is determined by the environment, like with those turtles. So, not only are there more than just X and Y chromosomes, the whole concept of sex determination is an evolving thing, even for individual species. When they're studying this, one way scientists can try to learn how long a species has been using a particular system is by looking at the small sex chromosomes, so the Y or W for species that have them. The current thinking is that these small chromosomes have degraded over many, many generations. See, these small chromosomes carry what's called a master sex-determining gene, which is as important as it sounds. 
This gene controls reproductive traits. Like in humans, the process of developing these traits is regulated by a gene on the Y chromosome called SRY. Small chromosomes might have picked up genes like this through some kind of mutation or mutations. But however it happened, the thinking is that when a chromosome picks up a master sex determining gene, something changes. Either a region of these chromosomes or the whole thing stopped recombining during meiosis. Meiosis is the process that makes eggs and sperm. In it, a cell duplicates all of its chromosomes, then pairs of chromosomes line up and exchange genetic material or recombine. So the thinking is that at least part of structures like the Y chromosome just stopped recombining for some reason. That would have led the chromosome to lose bits and pieces and erode over time. So in this view, Y and W chromosomes that are significantly smaller than the X's or Z's are relatively old. In fact, there's even some evidence that these chromosomes can degrade so much they go extinct. That's what seems to have happened with a certain group of rodents called mole voles. Studies of its genome show that both sexes usually have one X chromosome and no second sex chromosome at all. The current leading explanation is that it lost the Y chromosome and some other parts of the genome took over sex determination. And for as dramatic as this sounds, it isn't bad. If this is what happened, it was just another part of the long changing arc of how sex determination works. So we've come a long way since Aristotle but there's still a lot to figure out. Like today, researchers are learning more about genes that can influence sex and how animals develop, including genes that aren't on sex chromosomes at all. We also have more to learn about why this is so complex. Those answers could come from studying how sex chromosomes evolve and comparing the evolutionarily old ones to their younger counterparts. But one thing is for sure, the world is a lot more nuanced than we often realize. And that just makes it a whole lot more interesting. Now, if you're into the whole, the world is super interesting and all kinds of super weird ways thing, you might enjoy our podcast, SciShow Tangents. It's a bunch of smart people in a lightly competitive setting showing off various science facts, including a bonus butt fact at the end of every episode. If you're interested, you can find SciShow Tangents wherever you get your podcasts.